I've spent my entire life dealing with change, changing an apartheid system, transforming an economy so that it's more inclusive of most South Africans, and actually more recently, looking at how we change the, the use of our resources in order that we can actually have a planet to support future generations. It's been an amazing journey for me personally. It's been a very exciting space to be in. And, but I do give a word, a word of caution here. Very often when we're trying to affect paradigm shifts in society, what we do is that um, we really are a part of a social engineering project very often. And we need to be alert to ourselves when we do this. We need to constantly critique ourselves. Because the one thing that tends to happen is that we come up with many, many unintended consequences. And it's those consequences that we need to be mindful about. And in many ways, what we really need to be doing is constantly reviewing ourselves and saying, what I'm changing today will need to be changed tomorrow again and again and again. And I want to look at that in the context of South Africa, and I particularly want to look at it in the context of black economic empowerment, um, what we all refer to as BEE. And the reason is we probably don't think about this very much, but BEE is the biggest social engineering project that has been undertaken in post-apartheid South Africa. It's an effort to completely transform our business sector, and it operates on many, many platforms. Now, it's been going on for about 20 years. I came back into the country from exile with many others. Um, but I chose not to extend my political activism into a political career, but rather chose to focus on economic transformation. And that's been, got me into the area of conceptualizing black economic empowerment and being among those early um, designers of it. And we, we, it was fairly simple in the beginning. We looked at the commanding heights of the economy and we said it needs to change. It needs more black faces essentially right up at the top echelons of decision makers, but also it needed to change the ownership of what was a largely white-owned economy. We wanted to create those black-owned corporate skyscrapers on the horizon of business. But very, very quickly it became discredited. It was very much part of business driving it, but people got disillusioned, largely those excluded from it, believing it was much more about enrichment than it was about empowerment. And for those who'd been beneficiaries, they felt they hadn't benefited enough. And we have had government intervene, we've got government raise the ante, we've had them extend and broaden the range, the reach of empowerment. But the disillusionment and the disappointment around this area has been quite profound, and it's very much represented by the image of him. And I'm sure you all have seen this, and we've seen Sapira today, and he's our amazing cartoonist who captures moments amazingly. No matter how much you want to say that there's been good come out of empowerment, it is extremely difficult to compete with that image. And I don't think we should be. I think we should really, we've reached a tipping point and should be moving on. And when I, uh, well, it was about a, two years ago I published a book on this and dealt with both the good and the bad of empowerment. But one of the areas I dealt with much less but started delving into was the interplay between economic transformation and change, poverty alleviation, and then the risks that our planet have as a result of climate change and um, resource degradation. And because of looking at that and starting to explore that area, I ended up in a very unexpected position, which was being advisor to the premier of this province and being responsible for spearheading um, the green economy um, for this province. But it's extremely important to start thinking about what it is that we really could be doing differently or what it is we could really be doing otherwise. And in writing the book, I think what really struck me when I did my research was that we're using 50-year-old formulas to solve problems that, that are quite different to the former periods. We've never experienced what we're going through today. And that we really needed to start being a lot more innovative and start to think about 
what it is and where it is we want to be. And so as part of my research, I went to Vietnam, not because Vietnam has any practices any black economic empowerment, <laughs> but basically I went there because they, they're a country that has pulled themselves out of poverty faster than any country in history. And at the end of that trip, I felt that they, the way they had done that was that they had released individual energy. The control of the state had been removed from the rice paddies and handed over to individual farmers. And as a result of that, Vietnam very quickly changed from being a rice um, importer to being a rice exporter. And they then advanced many other reforms after that and changes to their economy. And in that process, despite being a communist government, that hasn't changed still, um, they changed their storyboard about who they were as a society and how they approached their society. And time again, in every interview that I conducted there, people had similar words about what described themselves as the Vietnamese and what enabled them to do what they were doing. And those words were like, we are very flexible. We are very pragmatic. Um, we're self-reliant. They were very proud of the fact that they'd never asked for compensation from the Americans after that very brutal war. So I want us just to sit with that in mind and, and think about that. And I want to come back home to South Africa and to look again, we stay with some farmers, and to look at, look at what what I felt really triggered me when I, was reading, uh, when I was writing my book. And that was the fact that there was a little known policy that the South African government was pursuing, which was to encourage our white farmers to leave South Africa for other African pastures. Because we were having a flagging land reform program, we were unable to distribute all the land that we needed to distribute, and therefore what we did was we thought, well, if we can just clear away the white farmers, we can come and bring in some black farmers. At the same time as we were doing that, and, then, and other African countries were completely encouraged by this, I mean, one of the comments they made was that they had, um, that they found that our farmers were very adept at farming in difficult conditions. So then what we did was, at the same time as this, we were getting um, more data coming in on climate change and the impacts. And one of the pieces of data that there were was that we were going to face up to 35% drop in agricultural productivity if we continued on the same path that we were doing over the next 20 to 30 years. You have to ask yourself one question. Why were we asking our white farmers, who would best be able to help us adapt to those climatic conditions, to leave the country? This looked like an economic transformation exercise that was destined to be a lose-lose one. So, Again, staying with farming and coming even closer to home, let's get back to the Western Cape. And you will know that a year ago, we had some very violent protests and strikes here. And just before that, I went to, um, into the winelands to encourage companies to participate in some green programs that we were promoting under this banner of 110% green. And one of the companies had become a flagship, and they had adopted a whole program around cycling for their employees. They had faced high absenteeism, lateness at work, and the employees had indicated that transport was a problem. So they got bicycles, very simple solution, and they had a remarkable result. Increased productivity, healthier employers, and very low absenteeism. So we were appealing to other companies to join this. We thought, what a wonderful program for the Western Cape. We could roll it out. And so I put it to a hall of businesses and got back just one simple response, silence. So I said, you know, I mean, really, this is a very small ask we're, we're making here. So I suggested to them to think about Maracana, which as you know, took place a few weeks before this incident when I was with them, where there were many workers that were, um, had been massacred and mine workers as a result of, of strike action, and said to them, yes, showed how much volatility there existed in our society, and felt it was very important for us to start giving a little bit more. I got back stony silence, um, and we went away as a team in this program quite despondent, and we never have yet got to get our cycling program together. But I think what's very important for me when I looked at this was that we've been trying to do more of the same with empowerment and trying to turn things around. And the proverb came to my mind 
that you're all, I'm sure, very aware of, is that the more, the more things we try to change, the more we stay the same. And so when looking at the book I was writing and looking at what I was doing and the way forward, I really felt that we needed to rethink black economic empowerment. We needed to take out that racial boundary around transforming our economy. And we needed to think of it from the perspective of the challenges we were facing in the future. We all know that, I mean, I think that we're facing the biggest challenge humankind has ever faced, and that's been a planet at risk. But at the same time, we're living in the most extraordinary times with the extraordinary technological innovation taking place in a very highly complex global environment. And so I think it's time to start putting a different lens on what we do, to remove that black lens, and I'm going to say let's put a green lens. And I think I want us to think about a green lens, not from the point of view of just being environmentally friendly. I think it goes beyond that. I think it's a set of principles, it's a set of goals, and it's a set of approaches. And I just want to give you three or four of those just to leave with you in this talk in the few minutes that I've got left. One of them is about balance. I think it's a fundamental principle. And balance really means that whatever we do to take now to develop our economy, we need to give back and be mindful of future generation. The other is about poverty alleviation. If climate change, as we, we believe, is going to impact the poorest the greatest, then we need to do something about that. We need to look at climate change and green in the context of meeting the needs of the poor. I think that we also need to start looking at um, efficiency in a way that we've never done. The current capitalism is very, very inefficient. Um, consumerism, the way we use our resources. So it's a whole different approach on that. But it's also about being very inclusive. I think a green, I want us to think about green as involving everybody. And it's everybody taking very small steps. It doesn't sound very revolutionary. But it is actually, that's what we need to be doing. And the one empowerment that I've always felt about, it's very exclusionary. It wastes a huge amount of energy we could be mustering up among people. So there are other things we can be looking at as well. New collaborative partnerships. We've got to find working in very uncomfortable and different ways together. And I watch that in government when they need to partner with different organizations and how uncomfortable they feel because they're normally feeling they're always in control. And then, of course, I think we need to consider the fact that we have to have a profoundly innovative approach on life. I think that's, for me, what green fundamentally means. We've got to tread new territory. We've got to take ourselves to different places. And we've got to be able to do it mindful and balance and in small steps and recognize where we're going. And I think if we can look at economic empowerment in that green lens, then perhaps we could challenge that proverb, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thanks very much.